Last December, Ontarians saw images of their Prime Minister and Premier greeting refugees from Syria with hugs and assistance. Asylum seekers in Australia get quite a different reception. Government policy bans migrants arriving by boat from being permitted into the country. Academy Award-winning documentarian Eva Orner takes a look at Australia's approach in her new documentary. It's called Chasing Asylum. It recently premiered at the Hot Docs Film Festival in Toronto, and Eva Orner joins us now. Great pleasure to meet you. Thanks for having me. I saw your documentary, Eva. It is unbelievably powerful. Congratulations. Thank it's a, you. It's a great job. I want to start just by doing an excerpt here, which we shall do to set the table for our discussion. As of July 19, 2013, asylum seekers arriving by boat will not be settled in Australia. Instead, they are sent offshore to detention centers in either the Republic of Nauru or Manus Island in Papua New Guinea. At the time of filming, you tell us 2,175 asylum seekers and refugees were on these two islands. Where do the people trying to seek asylum in Australia come from? Um, historically, over the last 15 years, they've been from Afghanistan, mainly Hazaras, from Iran, from Iraq, Lebanon, um, Sri Lanka, Somalia, and now Syria as right. well. You're not from any of those countries, so I want to know where the motivation comes from to want to tell that story. I'm Australian. I've lived in America since 2004. Um, but this film took me back to Australia. It wasn't I didn't particularly want to go back, but I felt so strongly about this. I was watching it for 15 years uh, from America. And I, my history, I'm originally Australian. I'm first generation. My parents were born in Poland in 1937 Jewish. Four of my, three of my four grandparents perished in the Holocaust. And this has really informed my work. I grew up in the shadow of genocide. And I grew up knowing that bad things happen to good people and I couldn't sit by and watch my country that I was so lucky to grow up in, in a free democracy uh, and receive an amazing education and life, mm. treat innocent people who need our help in such an appalling way. So you know firsthand what happens when the world shuts its doors on people <laughs> who need help. Yeah, you I do. mean, yeah, I feel really strongly about the Refugee Convention of which Australia was an early signatory and being part of that, uh, being part of that convention means people can come to your country fleeing persecution and you cannot turn them away. And we have been blatantly disregarding the Refugee Convention for a long time. Well, one of the reasons we know that is because you show us that in your movie and you show us that in a way that I don't know how you did it because you got, you got hidden cameras into places where you're not supposed to have cameras. How did you do that? Um, <laughs> I mean, the big issue with the big problem with this issue in Australia is that the government has been operating this policy under a massive secrecy operation for 15 years. No journalists, no filmmakers, no cameras are allowed into the detention centres. Um, it's actually now a criminal act in Australia to speak out about conditions in the camps. If you're a government employee and you work in Nauru or Manus, there is a new legislation which is sort of like the Homeland Security Act in America. It's called our Border Force Protection Act. Um, and there is a whistleblowing clause in it which says if you speak out about conditions in the camps, you can. it's a criminal act with two years jail. So as some a of the people in your film broke the law to bring this story to the public. As far as I'm aware, we've done nothing illegal. You haven't, but maybe they have. No, as far no? as I'm aware, there's nothing illegal okay. in the film. And by nature of secret footage, it's something I can't discuss. Other, really, all that I can say is that there's been very little footage that's come out of the camps for a long time and I feel like the Australian public needs to see and the world needs to see what we're doing to women, men and children and maybe that will change things. This is what I was wondering. I mean, is this the first time that Australians will actually be seeing what's going on there? There's been little bits and pieces that have come out and we've licensed and used some of that in the film but about 90% of the footage is exclusive to my film and it's been very, very difficult to get and it's something that I'm... I mean, I don't want to say proud because it's so horrible, but I just think it's really important to shame Australia internationally and also to educate and show Australians and also Australian politicians because most politicians haven't been to Nauru or Manus. And I'm saying in Australia, I'm saying to all the politicians, none of whom would speak to me in the film because right. I'm so terrifying. Um, I'm just saying, come and see the film and look at what your policies are doing. You know, you have families, you have children. Can you really sleep at night knowing this is what you're doing? Here's another excerpt from your movie. You say, in 2013, Australia cut its refugee intake from 20,000 to 13,750. Per capita, Australia ranks 67th hmm. in the world for intake of refugees. There are an estimated 60 million 
displaced people in the world right now, that's the highest since World War II. How did Australia come to have the refugee policies that mm. it currently has? Um, John Howard, who was our Prime Minister, long-term Prime Minister since from 2001, uh, started it. He is the father and the pioneer of the Pacific Solution um, and it all started with the Tampa which was a boat in 2001 that came to Australia full of Hazara Afghans. He was facing defeat and an election and very shrewdly turned this into an election issue. He stopped the boat coming from Australia and ultimately sent the people to Nauru and shortly after Manus Island was opened and ever since then except for a very short period where the camps were closed this has been our policy and elections have been won and lost in Australia over this issue and part of the vernacular are words like stop the boats, um, you know, queue jumpers. Um, it, it's, it's just become this absolute election issue and I think that Australians have been completely missled into believing this is what we have to do and that we're being invaded. Uh, are all the parties on the same yeah. place on this? The biggest disappointment is our Liberal Party is our Conservative Party, right. Labor is our, you know, our Democrats. Currently our Labor government has the same policies and they are a massive disappointment. Now presumably both the mainstream parties feel this way because they feel they represent the views of the average Australian. Do you think that's true? I think the tide's turning. We're not at a tipping point yet, but there's been a lot of demonstrations recently. Two people have died in detention. Women are being raped. Children are, we're the only country in the world that detains ch children indefinitely. Um, there were recently a lot of rallies and demonstrations to stop children being returned to Nauru and they worked. Doctors and, and nurses are speaking out defiantly, again, risking being imprisoned. And I feel like the film hopefully is coming out at a great time now and will galvanise Australians and also educate them in what is going on because mm. you know it's so interesting people say a legal asylum seeker all the time in the film you see the head of our military in a propaganda commercial saying if you come to Australia illegally by boat there's no such thing and so I feel like Australians have been hoodwinked into believing we're being invaded we should be scared of these people these people are terrorists and I think partly and I will say this and it's not a popular view but it's because on some levels we are deeply racist um, we are xenophobic and most of the people coming are brown and Muslim. And you think that's what's underpinning all of this? Hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you know, if that was a bunch of white people on a boat, do you think they'd send them to torture gulags in third world countries? Well, but the strange thing is, I mean, and I remember well, we went through the same thing in the 1970s with the boat people, your country and mine, opened their arms, opened their doors, and people came in and Australia did not have the reaction then that it does today. So what happened? Well, this was the Vietnamese in the late 70s yes. and early 80s, and I show that in the film. And Malcolm Fraser was the Prime Minister who did that, and he recently passed away, and I dedicated the film to him, and I did one of the last interviews with him. And he was from our Conservative Party. That's how far our country has moved politically to the right, which is really shocking. Um, and kind of, I think it says a lot about the state of the world at the minute. I think people are scared. The Middle East is really unstable. Um, I think obviously 9-11 played into this. I think ISIS, terrorists, you know, Islamophobia. I mean, it's really easy for people to be frightened, to panic, to fear, and to want to protect themselves. But just to be clear here, your, your movie focuses on those who arrive by boat, destitute, with nothing, trying to, you know, obviously escape some horrendous situation back home. Mm. If you were to go to a quote unquote regular office and seek asylum kind of not by boat but another way, how welcoming is Australia under those circumstances? Um, <laughs> the problem is at the minute the system is completely overtaxed. So if you go to a refugee agency, if you go to, so a lot of the people that can't come to Australia now because the boats are, stop, are stuck in Indonesia mm. and you register with the UNHCR, you get refugee status, you can be waiting there for 10, 15, 20 years. Mm. The world is full of refugees. The average wait in a refugee camp is a lifetime. Yeah. Um, you know, what would you do if you were desperate, forced out of your country, had nothing, had nothing to lose? Mm. Wouldn't you pay someone and try and get on a boat and go to this great land, the promised land, the lucky country? Mm. I'd do it. Let's show some of your documentary, so, shall we? Yeah. Sheldon, if you would, let's roll this clip. One of the worst accommodation, a World War II hut made of tin on a concrete floor. 122 double bunks in this shed. Manus Island is tropical, and these guys were housed in a, a tin shed. It was 
disgusting. The, the odour was disgusting. I just couldn't believe what I was looking at. It was amazing. Manus looked like they'd jailed me. The men were padlocked in by gates. There was feces, open feces on the ground. Men didn't have enough clothes. Men didn't have shoes. They didn't have enough drinking water. There was malaria. There was sickness, disease, infection. OK, a couple of things to follow up on there. The two people that you quote there, who are they? Martin is, a, he, was a, he was a former corrections officer in Australia, and he then went to work as a security guard on Manus Island. And how did you manage to get him to speak about something which you're not really supposed to speak about, are you? No, I mean, no one's meant to speak about it. He, he came out and spoke publicly, and um, he's really brave. And he's, I think, one of the only people that works for the security companies that has come out. A lot of the people from Save, not a lot, some of the people from Save the Children and the Salvation Army, who previously had the contract, speak out. But the security guards are really few and far between. And Martin's really incredible because he's an older man. He's worked in the prison system his whole life. He's a tough guy. Is he going to get in trouble for doing that? No, he's OK, I think. I mean, anyone can get in trouble. But he's, spoke, he's been pretty public, so I think he'll be OK. But what was so shocking about him was he'd been gone for at least a year out of the camps when I met him. And he wept through the entire interview. Mm. And he's, I would say this about all the whistleblowers, they've all got post-traumatic stress disorder from working in the camps. Mm. And you, you can see why. I mean, you can see the conditions and the kind of people that they would have spent time with and the helplessness they felt. How long do some of the people live in those conditions, in those places? Currently, in Man on Manus and Nauru, a lot of the people have been there for over a 1,000 days, and it's indefinite. And that's children mm. as well, and women. How close are those places, but Nauru and Manus Island, how close are they to Australia? Um, Nauru is about a five, I think a five hour flight north from the northern tip of Australia. Mm. So it's kind of in the middle of nowhere and it's tiny. I mean, it it's Alcatraz. The hilarious thing about it, I mean, it's not hilarious, but they installed like a million dollar fence around the detention camp. And it's like, where are they going to go? It's Alcatraz. But I actually think the fence was to protect them from the locals because people get abused and raped and bashed when they're out in the community on Nauru. So the locals don't like having them there either? No, it's an island of 10,000 people. You put in like 1,500 people there. There's no jobs. There's, you know, it, there's nothing for them there and there's no way for them to integrate. It's, it's, it's pretty bleak. And then Papua New Guinea is also, you know, hours north of Australia. I mean, it's far away. There have been inv official investigations into what's gone on in these camps. What have those investigations mm. begat? Not very much. Um, I mean, people try and... There have been royal inquiries. There's constantly inquiries into... There's been two deaths on Manus Island mm. of young men. There's been alleged sexual abuse of women and children, uh, rapes, beatings. Any charges brought? There was just finally after... A, almost a year and a half after a young man called Hamid, who's in the film, who died of septicemia because he wasn't given adequate medical care. Um, there's, there was, there's an inquiry going in, on into him and Reza Brady, who was murdered during the riots on Manus Island, two men were just charged, but I think they'll be in jail for a couple of years. And interestingly, there were some Australians involved in his beating and death, mm. and they all fled Manus Island and came back to Australia immediately after the riot, and Australia won't return them to Manus Island to face the courts. Mm. Any changes to what's gone on there, procedures or anything like that, since all of this came public? Um, no, but what's really interesting that happened in the last week is um, the Supreme Court of Papua New Guinea has determined that Manus is illegally detaining people and it's not legal. Mm. And they've said Australia has to shut down the camps. However, <laughs> this last, a couple of months ago, uh, actually, sorry, last end of last year, the Australian High Court had the same case, a similar case about Nauru. It was the, the legality of detaining people indefinitely on Nauru was brought to the Australian High Court and the Australian High Court found it legal. But in preparation, the Australian government and the Nauruan government changed the classification of the camp to an open camp. So the doors, the gates are open, you can come and go as you please, but you can't go anywhere. And if you go outside too far, the chances are you'll get beaten up. So, that so it's this really cynical They found move. a loophole. And since the ruling last week from, pa from Papua New Guinea, uh, both Prime Minister Turnbull and our Immigration Minister Dutton have both said they're not coming to Australia. They will either change the classification on the camp, resettle those who have refugee status 
on Papua New Guinea, yeah. or they can go back to where they came from, or they can go to Cambodia. Well, that's the thing, right? This, this problem has now been outsourced to Cambodia. $55 million of taxpayers' money to bribe a developing country with a hideous human mm -hmm. rights record and no history of resettling refugees. In a year and a half, six people have elected to go there from Nauru, and three have left because it's so hideous. So that's not really an option. And we refoul, which is we forcibly return people to Syria and Afghanistan, breaking another set of rules in the Refugee Convention. And just last week, another, I mean, it, what's happening at the minute is so crazy, the film is really timely. Someone who was... Resettlement has just started for those who get refugee status on Papua New Guinea. Last week, a man who had been resettled in the community of Papua New Guinea was arrested climbing a fence of the detention centre trying to get back in because he felt so unsafe in the community. Mm. And yesterday, somebody self-emulated on Nauru. It's pretty having grim. said all of that, yes, it is, but having said all of that, um, the government has bowed to public pressure in Australia and they have taken in, I think the number is 12,000 Syrians. Yeah, I think to date about three, three or four have arrived. Have this arrived. was announced before I finished the film, so it was announced maybe in October. Do you take any carton from that? Yeah, if they'll let them in. In that time, you guys have let in about twelve or 20,000 Syrians or 12,000. 20, 25, I think. Right, so yeah. the, we, it was around the time when the young boy was washed up in the red shirt on the beach in Turkey and the whole world suddenly realised, oh my gosh, we have a crisis, yeah. which is, you know, the power of great photojournalism. And so Tony Abbott said, OK, we're going to take a one-off increase of 12,000 people. Um, the same day he announced we would join bombing campaigns in Syria hmm. and <laughs> connect the dots. But from what I understand, only a handful have been resettled and they're focusing primarily on Christian Syrians. Eva, what do you hope comes out of this film? I would like every Australian to see the film and every Australian politician because it gives them the opportunity for the first time to see what we are doing. It explains everything clearly. It's not hysterical. It's bipartisan. It's emotional in terms of what you see is emotional, but I'm trying not to be overly hysterical about it. I just want you to see the film and to go home and think, is this OK? Am I comfortable with this? And internationally, I wanted... My aim was to show it widely internationally so that Australia could get shamed a little bit. Are you concerned about how the government will react to this film, and particularly to you? <laughs> I don't think they like me very much. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, all I can say is I'd love to... I'd love them to see the film. I would love to speak to them. I mean, one of the most sort of sad parts of the film is the, the second last frame of the film is a card that reads, the following politicians declined to be interviewed for this film. And it's all of them. I mean, all your most recent prime ministers and immigration ministers, none it's of them would talk everyone, to you. everyone. Yeah. Every prime minister since 2001 and the last two immigration ministers. And you guys go through prime ministers like we go through hockey sticks here, right? Five in the last four years. <laughs> yeah, and none of them would talk to you. How scary am I? Are you scared by me? Terrified. <laughs> I don't want you making documentaries about me, that's for sure. Eva, it's a terrific movie. Thank you. And uh, it would not shock me if you won a second Oscar for this because it's such a valuable contribution Thank to our you. understanding of what's gone on. It's called Chasing Asylum. Eva Orner, thanks so much for coming into TVO you. tonight. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.